Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. So I'm, I'm David Coombs. Um, I'm a, a professor um, of forest ecology here in, in Cambridge. And, and the next, uh, th this session, what we're going to be talking about is <clears throat> the way computers and forest science can work better and together for a better world. So the first um, 50 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about nature-based solutions. Um, and, and then we're going to have a quick break and then we're going to come back and we're going to be talking with Professor Kejav, a new professor in the computing lab here in Cambridge, about the way computing uh, can really help us uh, to deliver uh, better uh, solutions to the world's problems. So we've got these two interlinked crises uh, in the world. We've got the cri climate crisis, which we're all starting uh, to, to notice. It's uh, no longer just a th uh, some, something theoretical that scientists have talked about. We're, we're seeing it visually uh, uh, affecting our lives. And then there's a biodiversity crisis as well, which um, perhaps has, isn't having such tangible effects as yet, but is equally problematic and huge. <clears throat> and here in Cambridge, we have uh, Cambridge Zero, uh, working to solve aspects of the climate crisis and, um, and I work for something called uh, Cambridge Conservation Initiative and um, we're working towards solving some of the problems with the biodiversity crisis and at the intersection of those two um, is something which we call nature-based climate solutions and so those are ways which we can use uh, nature to help us uh, solve some of the problems uh, related to climate to the climate change to help mitigate some of the climate change. And nature turns out to be extremely important in this regard. And so more generally, nature-based solutions are way, uh, ways to use nature to solve societal problems. And later on, we'll, we'll hear from some speakers ab about that. So what we're gonna um, do is, um, we're gonna have a, a quick conversation from me, a uh, uh, talk from me about nature-based solutions and some of the work we've been doing in the, in the UK looking at nature-based solutions. And then I'm gonna move on and, uh, and uh, allow other people to, to, to give uh, sort of quick fire conversations, uh, quick fire talks about uh, nature-based solutions. And that will lead on to a conversation of, uh, at the end about some of the uh, problems and trade-offs and, uh, and opportunities we have. So as I said, I work in the, um, this thing called the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. And here we have um, David Attenborough <coughs> at the age of um, 90. <laughs> very good sport that he is, opening our building a few years back. Uh, he's the patron of the uh, uh, Cambridge Conservation Initiative, and it's wonderful to have him supporting us. And we're, we're actually a collaboration between the university and uh, all these organisations here, some of whom will be very familiar to you. And there's about 500 of us all co-located in a building in the centre of town called the David Attenborough Building, <laughs> and funnily enough. And, uh, and we're working together uh, on some of the most pressing uh, biodiversity problems. So the one, one thing which is clearly a way which we can, we can um, use nature <coughs> to, to help the, uh, solve the climate crisis, it's only going to be one component of it, as we'll come back to, um, is by protecting uh, forests. And this is a, a very, um, a, a sadly, a very common scene across the tropics. Here we have um, a scene from uh, Sabah in, Mal in Malaysia, and we've just got rainforest, which has been replaced over vast scales by oil palm plantations. And those oil palm plantations are um, providing um, oil products which appear in many things we see on our supermarket shelves. And so over the last um, <clears throat> 40, 50 years, we've just seen this dramatic um, change in forest cover uh, through, through, through Borneo from a largely forested country, that's a, that's a large island in Southeast Asia, a largely forested company, country in the 70s to today when the light green areas are logged, often heavily logged forests and the black areas are plantations. And so we've got, now we've actually got amazing opportunities um, to protect those forests uh, and for the, for the val value that they have as carbon sinks uh, drawing carbon di dioxide out of the atmosphere and in doing so uh, we, we need to come up with a mechanism for actually paying for that service which those those forests are providing 
Uh, and if we can come up with a way of, of paying uh, for those forests to, protect, to be protected, they stand a much better chance than if we, uh, we just base that um, on the intrinsic value of nature. Personally, I love nature. I love to spend my days uh, out in the woods, out in the, out in the hills, enjoying nature. But that intrinsic value isn't enough to prevent uh, deforestation uh, when there's huge profits to be made and, uh, from, from oil palm and, and logging. So we need to pay uh, to protect these forests. And we can protect the forests. Hopefully we can protect uh, local livelihoods and also uh, do something to mitigate climate change. So that's one example of, um, of nature-based solutions in the tropics, and we'll come back to that later. But a, a really important thing which has happened in the UK is that our government has been really engaged in the idea of nature-based solutions. And I, and I think um, we have to, to thank Michael Gove for this when he was uh, Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, 2004. 17 to 19, and he, he came up with a 25-year plan for our, the environment, thinking about what would happen um, when we left the EU and the common agricultural policy was a thing of the past, what should we place it? And one of his mantras was this idea of public money for public good, that we should, we should be investing in the countryside, but to deliver things which are good for the public. Uh, and one of, one of the things the government is committed to uh, astonishingly, is to, to plant 300 kilometers squared of forest every year uh, for the foreseeable future. That's the, that's the English government. The Scots have come up with a very similar commitment. Uh, so that's a huge amount of forest <laughs> which, uh, which uh, uh, the governments hope to, to plant in the coming years. And the uh, primary purpose of those is to take up carbon out of the atmosphere and store it into forests as a part of our efforts to to offset uh, carbon emissions and reach zero net emissions by 2050. So quite a challenge, but also a vast amount of land use change, which, um, which is sort of impending. And the government's been uh, calling for recently about how that should be done. So we've been thinking about this. How can you come up with solutions that are good for carbon storage, good for nature, good for timber production, good for people, and don't have weird unintended consequences uh, in the context of the British countryside. So what are some of the ideas? Well, actually restoring peatlands is a bit of a no brainer. That's the, that's the, the really easy one. Uh, peatlands form very slowly. They've got these marvelous plants called sphagnum in them, which, um, which engineer the land around them to make, make it waterlogged. And, and uh, they sort of self-perpetuate themselves unless they're damaged by, by uh, cutting drains through them or uh, other forms of damage. And if you damage them, then they release a huge amount of that, of that uh, stored carbon, which they've stored over thousands of years into the, into the atmosphere again. So just protecting those is a no brainer. It, it works uh, on, on delivering all those solutions, which I just mentioned. What about other way, but that's not a way of planting all those trees I mentioned. What about planting conifers? Well, conifers are good in some regards. They, they are good for uh, meeting our domestic um, wood demand. We're actually uh, the second only to China in the world for the amount of wood we import at the moment uh, and we have an industry employing 43,000 people. So, it, so conifers su supply us with wood and that's good. They're actually also good at uh, taking out carbon uh, from the atmosphere unless, as is currently uh, commonly the practice, they're planted on organic soil, so peaty soils. Uh, and the scientific evidence now is increasingly the case that actually if you do plant them on, on organic soils, um, much of the gains you see in the biomass, the trees growing huge around you, is lost from the soils as they grow. So there's no net uh, carbon advantage. So you have to be very careful where you plant conifers in order to be a carbon benefit. And of course, they're not particularly good for biodiversity compared with planting uh, native woodlands. So then a second choice is planting native uh, forests on acid grasslands. These are the grasslands which are low productivity. They're not particularly species rich. Um, and, and so there's some, some real benefits to that. We can, we, can, uh, we can, particularly if we plant native species, it's good for biodiversity. It's good for carbon. Probably not particularly good for timber production. Um, and it's going to have an unintended consequence, a really difficult one, unless we change our diets to more vegetable 
uh, based diets and stop eating quite so much beef and lamb. And the, and the problem is that if we reduce our production um, uh, of, of those animals on our grasslands, we're just in exporting the problems to other parts of the, of the world. So there's a trade-off here with that one, an unintended consequence. Managing our native woodlands, we all love these, we want to keep these. There's 35,000 of them spread across the UK, all tiny, almost all tiny. The thing about these is actually to manage them for biodiversity, we, we want to um, harvest trees and keep the canopy open. That's the best thing for biodiversity. So they're very good at storing carbon, but they're not gonna be good at storing extra carbon in the future. And the last idea um, is to reconnect uh, and expand uh, nature reserves. So we've got small pockets of, of valuable nature on the, on the, on the ground, um, and we, we could reconnect them by planting extra woodlands or allowing, allowing rewilding to take place. And the, and the good thing about that is it's fantastic for nature. The bad thing is it's not going to be particularly quick at sequestering carbon. At the moment, we, our forests take out about 4% of the carbon we produce uh, through emissions, so a tiny percentage. If we do this, um, it won't be till 2050, 2060 before we have really large effects. So we've got a, a really difficult set of decisions to make, but an exciting way forward into the future as a result of this government initiative to, to, uh, to use nature-based solutions in the UK context. One thing we really don't want to do, and I won't touch on it any more than to mention it, is we shouldn't be using UK wood to fuel UK power stations. It takes a tremendous amount of land to use wood in power station. Drax here would use every bit of wood uh, produced across the UK to meet its current demand. So that's a, a very uh, wasteful use of our resources to do that. So that's the end of my little talk, but I now want to, to move over to Ellen Quigley. Uh, and Ellen is, uh, works in the old schools of the university. She's an uh, advisor uh, to the chief financial officer uh, on in, in responsible investment. Uh, and she does all sorts of interesting things in that field. And she's taken a, a great interest in uh, agricultural soils. Thank you, David. And uh, yes, I suppose that's my warning that I'm not a I'm not a soil scientist. Um, I've just been working with some of the bursars on um, various soil related things. Um, so in a, just a very few minutes here, I'm going to start by scaring you about soil um, and some of the implications of um, its kind of loss in quality over the last um, few decades in particular, um, and then go through what needs to be done to restore it and then what the tremendous benefits um, would be of doing so in terms of um, both carbon sequestration and biodiversity. Um, and a little um, hint of what we're doing uh, here at Cambridge. Um, so to start with, um, there have been reports put out by the UN and others um, warning us that we have uh, under 60 years of harvests left um, with the current degradation of soil quality um, due to modern farming practices. Um, so that already sounds quite scary, but then if you kind of play that out a bit, it becomes much scarier because you think, well, this, this is our food supply um, and there's a potential for uh, forced migration and conflict on a tremendous scale if we see the um, continued uh, degradation of our of our soil in this way. Um, so, you know, we, in addition to all of the other uh, issues we are facing with the climate crisis, um, to have this rapid de degradation of soil quality to the point at which um, growing food um, at any productive scale, um, you know, a few decades from now could be a problem is, is, is really quite frightening. Um, but now that I've um, maybe scared you a bit, uh, there are some actually fairly basic things you can do to um, at least reduce that, um, if not to actually substantially improve the quality um, of soil. Um, so uh, one of the big things is um, what's called no-till um, um, agriculture or minimum till in the UK in some places, it seems like uh, no-till isn't quite an option, um, but it really means that uh, you just uh, don't churn up the soil every time you want to plant something new, you just directly plant things into um, the soil without disturbing it first. Um, and uh, covering cover crops uh, throughout the, the winter months to make sure that soil doesn't blow away is another thing you can do. Um, uh, in addition to using fewer inputs in the first place, like fertilizers and so on, um, as well as improving biodiversity more generally, because then you get uh, more diverse insect spe species who can kind of eat one another and control the pests that would normally require the application of those uh, inputs. Um, 
So if you can imagine what the implications of all of this would be, it's, it's just as good as, as, as you'd think. Um, so you end up with uh, direct carbon sequestration in the soil, as in you can actually undo some of the harm that we've done with um, carbon emissions by um, storing some of that carbon directly in the soil. Um, you can look at, you can get improvements in terms of uh, biodiversity itself, which has knock-on benefits, of course. Um, uh, healthier soil uh, absorbs water better which is huge, especially as we come into a period in which droughts um, are, are going to be, unfortunately, much more common. Um, and that's in addition to the improved nutritional content of the food that you grow with healthy soil. Um, so that's, that's pretty huge. And not least, then, that can result in um, savings for the farmer, both in terms of time and money. Because if you have fewer inputs, like fertilizers and so on, that's a cost savings. But not having to do uh, tillage is also um, a big deal uh, as well. Um, so, so all that's actually quite quite exciting and a bit of a win-win story if you have a longer term view of agriculture, which fortunately we do um, here at Cambridge because we have, um, well, we've been around for over 800 years and the plan is to continue to do that. Um, so a lot of the landowning colleges, well, all of the major landowning colleges have started to get together and have initial discussions around how they might improve uh, the soil quality of the agricultural lands um, that they own. And that comes to, we estimate about 50,000 acres. So that's a huge um, head start. Um, and that is partly because you can um, think a little bit long-term um, with, uh, with owners like this, because uh, um, if you think about the adjustments that would need to be made um, for a lot of farmers, that's really difficult to do because you end up losing money for the first few years. Um, you really need the support to keep that going. Um, anyway, so I'm quite excited about the potential to do this, um, not just at Cambridge, but uh, elsewhere so that we can um, avoid the unhappy future I kind of um, laid out for you at the beginning of this um, few minutes. Um, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening and uh, thanks for David for having me. Oh, hello. Um, did, was, was I quiet all that time? I, I apologize. So thank you very much, Ellen. Um, um, we're going to next have um, Tom Worthington talking with us. Um, uh, and Tom's a postdoc here in the, in the um, uh, David Attenborough building, and he works on blue carbon. Thank you very much, Tom. Good evening and thank you to everyone for joining this evening. Uh, as David said, my name is Dr. Tom Worthington and I'm a research associate in the Conservation Science Group here at the University of Cambridge. And I'm funded by the Nature Conservancy to carry out global scale mapping of coastal ecosystems. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the coastal environment is one of the most intensely impacted parts of the planet. About half the world's population live within about 150 kilometers of the coastline. And that's resulted in large scale urban and industrial development, which I've kind of shown with this really extreme example of the, the extent change in Dubai. But this also led to clearing of land for agriculture and other human activities. This has resulted in unprecedented losses of many coastal ecosystems. Mudflats have been reclaimed for port development. Seagrass meadows have suffered pollution from agricultural and industrial runoff and closer to home, I'm sure we can think of salt marshes that have been converted to farmland. The example I'm showing you is from the Mahakan Delta in Indonesia. Inland, in yellow, you can see the impact of urbanization on agriculture and agriculture on tropical forests. But I want you to focus on those light blue areas near the coast. These were once extensive mangrove forests but the light blue signifies that they're now aquaculture ponds for commercial prawn and shrimp fisheries. And the next time you go to the supermarket, I'd like you to have a look at the sort of tiger prawns and other large prawns to see where they'd come from. And often they will have come from places like this, these converted areas in countries like Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam. 
At the same time as remote sensing has allowed us to get a better idea of the losses of those ecosystems, there's a growing recognition of the value that they provide to local populations and also the global community as a whole. These ecosystem services, the benefits they provide to people, link directly to this idea of nature-based solutions that we're here to talk about this evening. They tackle socioeconomic challenges through food provision and sustainable livelihoods and help us adapt and mitigate climate change. For example, salt marshes, coral reefs and mangroves help protect coastal communities by reducing storm surges from flooding. It's estimated that mangroves alone provide flood benefits of about $65 billion per, dollars per year. These coastal ecosystems are often also important tourism areas for outdoor recreation, such as walking and bird walks. And I'm sure we've all seen this has become more critical during the COVID um, pandemic. Another area that's garnered a lot of attention is around carbon and climate change. Coastal ecosystems such as seagrass meadows, tidal marshes and mangrove forests have been termed blue carbon ecosystems as they sequester disproportionately large amounts of carbon. And this has stimulated a lot of policy interest in protecting and restoring these ecosystems. Here at the University of Cambridge, we're engaged in a number of projects linked to the conservation sector, mapping these ecosystems using remote sensing and cloud computing, but also trying to quantify the value of these ecosystem services and the opportunities for restoration and conservation. For example, seagrass beds and mangrove roots uh, provide structure, as I'm showing here in this picture. And in the coastal environment, these represent critical spawning and rearing habitat for fish and invertebrates. These species obviously have conservation value, but often provide livelihoods and food resources for coastal communities, often in low income countries. Some work we were involved in a recent study, we've mapped fishing intensity across the world's mangroves. And as you can see from the map, there's high levels of fishing pressure in southern and southeast Asia, but also parts of West Africa and South America. And this gives us a starting point. Uh, to consider areas for greater conservation or restoration. We're also actively involved in restoration research. Restoration of coastal uh, ecosystems has been undertaken in many lo locations. For example, if we think close to home, the RSPB, one of CCI's partner organisations, has just undertaken a multi-million pound restoration of Wallasey Island as part of their Wild Coast project. And this has created 270 hectares of new coastal lagoons and salt marshes. And this is directly linked with the idea of future-proofing the Thames estuary for climate change and sea level. In the picture that I'm showing, these fences are being built to trap sediments and allow mudflats to develop on rapidly eroding coasts in northern Java. And it's hoped when the mudflats develop, mangroves will also re-establish themselves and help these communities reduce flooding. And again, this is particularly important in the face of climate change. However, not all restoration has been successful, but we are developing here at Cambridge tools that provide real world solutions to improve restoration success. For example, I, a couple of years ago, created this online app, which allows users to assess the restoration potential for every patch of mangroves in the world. This will help NGOs and governments and researchers identify the best areas to restore. And it also gives an indication of the potential benefits from restoration in terms of carbon storage and fisheries enhancement. All these projects are large scale interactions with researchers from across the world and also NGO staff. So I'd just like to thank them for their input. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. That was, that was excellent. Very interesting. And, and next we're going to move, uh, we're going to stay in the tropics and we're going to move uh, to, to hear uh, Michelle Kalamandin. And uh, Michelle comes. Uh, originally from Guyana uh, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, she's been in, in uh, the UK for a few years. She's very interested in, uh, in uh, payment schemes for protecting tropical forests and also indigenous rights. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you uh, talking tonight, Michelle. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so I'm going to talk, as David mentioned, a bit on nature-based solutions within tropical systems. Um, if we look at deforestation as a whole and we rank it according to the amount of emissions that it gives off, it would uh, be almost a third ranking uh, in terms of 
as a country behind uh, China and the United States. Um, if we looked also at the Paris Agreement, about 66% of, of countries have made uh, sort of pledges for green uh, or natural based solutions in order to help cut uh, these emissions. And the reason why this is so important is because tropical forests tends to have, be hotspots of biodiversity. Um, and some of the examples that they have used throughout um, like the different strategies that they've used is things such as uh, protecting intact forests through protected areas or even sustainable forest management. They've also looked at restoring degraded or uh, deforested systems, such as tree planting or even leaving the areas to grow naturally. Uh, sometimes you have to give incentives uh, for persons or local communities in order, or even countries themselves, in order to avoid deforestation or even help um, promote some sort of restoration. So to give you an example, in my own country in Guyana, uh, in 2009, Norway and the Guyanese government signed a, a bilateral agreement to sort of uh, help Guyana uh, in ensuring that they, de de they avoid further deforestation. Guyana as a country uh, tends to have a pretty high forest cover, but given because of uh, development, uh, a lot of this forest cover tends to be cut down. So the government of Norway worked with the Guyanese government in order to do a payment for payment for performance. Uh, so every year we get a sum of X amount of million dollars, uh, totaling up to 250 million over the five years. Now, if we look at when the project starts to when the project ends, one of the things we've noticed is because of this particular project, which is called um, Red Plus, um, a lot of you may heard of it or not, but it's, it's um, it's related to reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, one of the things we noticed when the time of implementation to the end of this project in 2015 was there was 35% lower deforestation within the country, uh, which uh, is estimated to about uh, 13 million tons of carbon dioxide not emitted. Another good example is in Brazil, uh, where they have just uh, released this program called Programa Floresta in June of, of this year. It's now the largest payment for ecosystem service uh, service is worldwide. Uh, initially it was in Mexico, but now Brazil now has the largest area. This program tends to focus a lot on native forests across all biomes uh, within Brazil, and that takes up about 560 million square miles. Now to put this in context, the entire European Union, uh, in terms of land surface area, is about 460 million square miles. Um, and this program, uh, again, it, with a bilateral agreement between Brazil and, and Norway, gives the Brazilian government about uh, 1 million, 100 million US dollars to filter into different programs. One of it is looking at conservation of, of its forests, especially in the Amazon region and the Cerrado as well as trying to recover some of the um, forests that have been lost. Um, other projects they have done is, is to filtering it not only as a national or, or regional area, but also community or project-based. So communities can also apply for funding to do um, either conservation or restoration um, within, within different areas within their communities as well. However, there's some limitation when we're applying uh, nature-based solutions. You know, it's not gonna compensate for all the emissions that have been uh, sort of produced over the last uh, century or so. We still need to reduce fossil fuel consumption. Um, a lot of the areas that have, have where nature-based solutions have applied have been mainly to agriculture and pasture, uh, not so much with severely degraded industrial uh, systems such as where areas that are formerly under oil or even mineral mining. Um, it's also important to, to note that implementation of a lot of these projects matter, including uh, whatever payment horizon. So whatever payment you introduce in order to avoid deforestation, it has to be at the same level at which communities were receiving money. So for example, if I was getting $10 for every log that I took out of the forest, then that program has to compensate for about, for about $10 as well. 
Uh, it's also important to ensure that a lot of these programs are identifying um, high risk of forest loss. And, um, and so there's a, a lot of impact uh, from ensuring that these areas that are recovering were once area or, or areas that can recover um, were identified for potential uh, deforestation. And you know, um, with any sort of conservation system, uh, it's not, NBS is not a magical formula that will sort of solve everyone's problem. It's just important to learn uh, and to know where to apply them and when to do so. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank David for giving me the opportunity to talk and thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Michelle. That was, that was fascinating. And next, we're going to move across to Adam Pellegrini. Adam is a very fresh faced new lecturer all the way from California, and he's an expert on fire. He's just arrived um, to COVID Britain about a week ago, two weeks ago. He's, he's, he's no longer in quarantine, which is good. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. So let me share my screen. All right, so uh, as David said, I'm a new lecturer here and my research primarily focuses on how disturbances affect ecosystems. So you could call me an ecologist. And today I'm going to talk about fire and I'm gonna challenge the paradigm a little bit on, and think about how can we actually use fire and control it in a way that actually can help us achieve our goals and become a nature-based solution rather than fi perceiving fire as a threat to carbon storage. So fires play a huge role in the earth system. About 5% of the globe burns each year. This is a map here taken from satellite data uh, and it's averaging burned area over the last 10 years or so. And fires occur in just about every biome. So they've played a key role in the evolution of species and basically just about every sort of cycling of element on land. But fires are also a large source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. They release around 2 billion million grams of carbon. And just to put that in perspective, that's about 20% of what humans emit due to fossil fuel consumption. But for the most part, things can regrow after fire, but sometimes that takes a long period of time. And as fires are shifting in frequency, there's a, the worry that you have the potential to emit more and more carbon with global warming. The, the fires in Siberia have been all over the news, the fires in my home state, California as well. And when those fires burn through the ecosystem, they combust carbon stored in biomass and they turn it into a gas. So either carbon dioxide or methane, and they can cost a lot of money. So in the US alone, every year fires impart about a $350 billion economic burden and they kill people. But in many cases, fires can be a natural process in the ecosystem. So often when we think about fire and it appears in the news, it's in some sort of uh, catastrophe type event, like the Amazon burning down or fires in Indonesia. And in those cases, fires are emitting a ton of carbon from ecosystems that didn't naturally burn. And as a consequence, it's a novel source of carbon to the atmosphere. But in many ecosystems, fire is a natural occurrence and the landscapes have adapted to live with fire. And so I've just put up a few examples here of some places that I do field work in. And you have savannas throughout the world and Africa and South America and North America, but then you also have forests that are adapted to fire like giant sequoia forests in the Sierra Nevada of California. And when you burn these ecosystems in a controlled way, so maybe you burn them at low intensities by burning them in a season where it's wetter, well, then you can promote the, the 
persistence of species that are capable of not only tolerating fire, so if a wildfire happens in the future, they'll be less likely to die, but also species that are more resilient to other things like drought and pest outbreaks. And we're seeing that in many cases where you exclude fire from the landscape and sure enough, when there is a pest outbreak or a big drought, you see massive losses of biomass. And when you are burning landscapes, you can also promote species that are great at storing carbon below ground in the soils, such as grasses. And when we think about fire, we often don't think about the soils burning, except in the case of peatlands, where peat's actually the main fuel for fire. But in fact, soils are very responsive to fire, and that's because fire changes the amount of biomass that goes into soils. And so as you change fire, you have the potential to change the carbon storage in soil. And that's actually a really big deal because soils are the dominant carbon storage pool on earth. They dwarf, or they just completely outpace any sort of carbon in vegetation. And a really interesting thing is that fire actually can stabilize soil organic matter. And by stabilize, I'm referring to fire thermally alters the organic matter in a way that makes it resistant to decomposition by microbes. So the formation of charcoal is one of the most well-publicized ways, but it also results in uh, several other processes. And what that then does is it helps the carbon in the soil stay in the soil. So it's less sensitive to warming, increasing decomposition. And so when you burn these landscapes, you can promote the stable soil organic matter. And some work that I'm doing currently is trying to map that potential across the globe and think about what is the fire regime that we need to maximize carbon storage and then what's the potential contribution of changes in soils to the response of carbon. And with that, I will end my show. Thank you very much, Adam. That's a really interesting talk and, uh, uh, and perhaps a, a contrary expectation to many people's uh, thoughts on fire. So that, that was really interesting. Um, next, we're gonna move um, I should mention one thing in response to one of the questions. So we're talking about nature-based solutions now, the various choices available to us. And after the break, uh, Professor Kejav and myself are going to talk about the, uh, the way in which we can uh, uh, use computer science uh, to, to help in this arena. So, so stay with us for the second half. <laughs> um, uh, but next we're going to have um, uh, Leo Liu, um, who's recently arrived as a lecturer uh, in the land economy department. And so his expertise is in, in, uh, in the economics of this, because uh, clearly if we're gonna get these systems working, we need to somehow pay people to incentivize them to, to, uh, to manage their um, land for nature and for carbon. So over to you, Leo, thank you. Thank you, David. So let me put on my slides. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. This is Leo, and it's my gr great pleasure to join this event. Uh, today I will briefly talk about uh, the impacts of payments for ecosystem services programs, or PES, and the connections with some catchy topics in computer sciences, like big data and machine learning. Uh, as mentioned by David, uh, I'm a new lecturer at the Department of Land Economy, University of Cambridge, and uh, I'm an environmental economist by training. Uh, so uh, um, just now we just mentioned that very often we would like forest holders to conserve their forests as a means to provide many environmental benefits, such as reducing um, biodiversity losses or mitigating climate change. But uh, obviously such actions um, haven't been so um, adequate Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have so much deforestation all over the world. Uh, I'm sure there could be many different explanations from different disciplines, uh, from, from, from different, different fields, but uh, uh, 
economists tend to think that one reason might be that such forest conservation actions are not compensated. So imagine if we, if we are buying um, some sort of a regular service or good, um, for example, suppose we are eating at a restaurant, so naturally we would be paying for the meal and the service. However, obviously that's typically that's not the case. Uh, that's, that's, that's not the case for forest conservation. So payments for ecosystem services or PS are sort of intended to address that problem by making payments to forest holders to undertake forest conservation actions. Nowadays, there are hundreds of PS programs all over the world, and uh, every year billions of dollars are being spent on these programs. So naturally, we would be curious about the performance of these programs in terms of uh, what environmental outcomes have been achieved. Uh, and also, we might be interested in uh, what impacts have been caused for uh, the providers of these environmental benefits. So if we look at the uh, uh, top graph on the right hand side, uh, this uh, is from a recent review that looks at the impacts of various kinds of conservation programs on deforestation. Uh, since we, are, uh, we want to look at PS, PS is, it, it is represented by the fourth blue box uh, from the left. Uh, as we can see, this, uh, this box is entirely below um, zero, although we just mentioned that the, the, the indicator is deforestation. So this means uh, globally overall, PES programs reduces deforestation, or in other words, PES programs um, overall uh, lead to a positive environmental impact. Now uh, we look at the uh, uh, bottom um, graph on the right-hand side, which is from a review study conducted by myself. So um, this study is about uh, uh, the impacts of PES on livelihoods of the providers of these environmental benefits. So as you can see, we looked at uh, quite a few PS programs from different countries in the world. And uh, these bars uh, show the livelihood impacts where uh, the black color means statistically significant uh, positive impact. And uh, uh, the gray color represents statistically insignificant livelihood in, uh, positive livelihood impact. So as we can see, it's a gray and black colors are sort of dominating uh, in this map, uh, which means that uh, globally overall, PS programs are likely to deliver some benefit to the providers of environmental benefits, but uh, such benefits are likely to be small. So um, since PS programs are primarily environmental programs, uh, why, why do we care about uh, the livelihood impacts? Um, well, there are quite a few reasons. Um, to start with, within the contract period, uh, if the providers of environmental benefits are only marginally better off or even worse off, would we be confident that they, they will comply with the provisions of the contracts? And uh, if not, uh, how would we better enforce those provisions? That, would that lead to uh, higher enforcement costs? Uh, and also, it's also quite important when the contracts um, expire or in the post-contract period. So we know that during the contract period, with the payments in place, um, the, the uh, providers of, uh, of ecosystem services are only marginally better off or even worse off. So what if those, uh, what if, uh, those payments disappear? So would these people reverse back to their business as usual scenario? And uh, in which case the uh, environmental services would disappear. Um, if so, should we just keep paying them forever? Uh, many researchers have been arguing that, well, PS programs could be designed in a very smart way that induces some perpetual changes in institutions and people's behaviors, which get these people out of depleting forests once and for all. But uh, obviously, um, this wouldn't be easy to, uh, to uh, achieve in practice, and uh, uh, this should be very context dependent. Uh, so we've seen that uh, it's quite important to understand the impacts or outcomes of PS programs. 
Uh, so uh, in my field, uh, very often we need to conduct observational studies to evaluate such impacts. By observational studies, I mean uh, usually uh, when there is a PES program in place, uh, we would go collect data on some environmental or li livelihood indicator from both participants and non-participants, and we compare the difference between the two, group, uh, the two groups, uh, and uh, we would regard the difference as the uh, um, impact of this PS program. So this is an observational data. However, obviously, this is likely to be correlation, uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean causality, uh, because the two groups might be systematically different before they entered this PS program. So after the PES program, if we observe any difference, say in forest cover or livelihoods between the two groups, such difference might be well caused by some other factors instead of the PES program per se. And uh, the recent emergence of big data and machine learning approach can help us improve such causal inferences. Uh, for instance, uh, with big data with much, much richer information, and amazing temporal and spatial resolutions, uh, we could have more information to control for those confounding factors uh, we are worrying about, so as to get a, a more precise estimate um, of the impact uh, of a PS program. Uh, and also, uh, and also uh, um, uh, well, I only have a very basic understanding about machine learning, and we have many excellent computer scientists in this, uh, in this event, so please do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in my basic understanding, uh, uh, I think uh, machine learning is really strong in predicting uh, things. For example, um, a commonly seen application of machine learning might be that when you shop online, uh, sometimes uh, those online shopping websites will recommend you uh, something based on what you have browsed or bought in the past. So this is like uh, using uh, some information to predict um, um, what you may be interested. Uh, however, here we are we, we are dealing with a different different question about uh, uh, what impacts are caused by PS programs. Uh, however, we just mentioned that uh, a fundamental difficulty in correctly identifying that impact is that uh, we don't know uh, what kinds of people are more likely to participate or what kinds of people are more likely to be affected by PS. So if we could use uh, the uh, machine learning approach to get a better prediction as to what kinds of people are more likely to participate, then we, we would be in a better position to um, control for um, potential confounding factors. Uh, lastly, um, big data and machine learning approach um, can facilitate some advanced methods which uh, help us improve causal inferences. For example, as we can see uh, in the uh, top graph on the right hand side, uh, there, is, there is this uh, approach called regression discontinuity, uh, in which uh, uh, so um, uh, in some cases um, there is a clear cutoff point as to the uh, eligibility of a, of uh, being involved in a PS program. For example, it might be possible that a PS program only offer contracts to some counties or areas, and then so we would have eligible counties or areas and, uh, uh, and, and uh, ineligible counties or areas. So before the PS, we would think that across the border of eligible and ineligible regions, everything might be evolving smoothly across this borderline. And uh, after, uh, after the PS program, if we observe some discontinuity across the borderline, say discontinuity in changes in forest cover, then we, we would be more convincingly um, 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 attributing that discontinuity to the PS program. So as we can see, basically we are fitting two trend lines uh, across the borderline. And uh, this is basically uh, um, fitting a model which better explain, explains or predicts the actual data points. Uh, well, uh, many methods in machine learning, such as model selection and cross-validation, can be very relevant. Um, okay, that's uh, pretty much about my talk. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, back to you, David.
Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, last but definitely not least is my good friend Val Kapos. Val is the head of the Climate Change and Biodiversity Program uh, at UNEP WCMC, the World Conservation Monitoring Centre of UNEP, and based here in Cambridge and a part of CCI. Um, before before we, we um, gathered this evening, Val mentioned the last meeting she went to, she was the last speaker in a session which overran and then, and then she was she was uh, sort of 20 minutes after the the, the, um, the, 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 the proper end date uh, end time and we've, we've got a similar situation tonight. We're running a little bit late. I'm sorry, Val, um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what you're going to say. Right. Well, I'll, I'll try very hard not to have a complex and I will try to be brief, but also to um, get my messages across if I can. So David asked me to talk about trade-offs, but I wanted to give a bit of context. Um, David mentioned the linked crises, and I wanted to um, put these in an international policy context because this is an awful lot of my world. I'm not expecting you to read the text. You can consider this an illustration of the fact that anything in the UN has to happen in 10 point courier. But um, what, what we're seeing, well, it was supposed to be this year and we're seeing it this year and it will come to fruition next year thanks to COVID, is we're finally seeing a convergence between two international environmental agendas that have been quite separate. For a long time, the Convention on Biological Diversity has been saying to the Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, oh, but nature is really important to address climate. You know, you, re you really need to pay attention to this. And for a really long time, um, the Convention on Climate has been saying, yes, dear, we've now got to a point, for, literally just in the last year or 18 months, really, so, also since the Paris Agreement was signed, where suddenly nature is front and center of the climate debate. And that's the basis for a lot of the talks you've heard tonight, that we're all looking at the role that nature plays in helping to keep carbon out of the atmosphere. And we're seeing as um, the international processes move forward that we're seeing quite a lot of coordination between them. And indeed, the UK government has put nature front and center in the agenda for the Climate Convention Conference of the Parties, which will be held in Glasgow in some form or other late next year. So we suddenly have to not just parallel but converging ways of making progress so it gives me some sense of optimism these international agreements are a lot of talking but they are actually quite a lot of the motivation behind then individual countries making progress themselves so nature-based solutions are central to the agenda of the climate convention we've heard a bit about what they are they're the use of nature or ecosystems to solve societal problems my reason for putting this slide up is to point out that they're not entirely new. Um, we've heard about natural infrastructure or green infrastructure or ecological engineering um, in many different fields. This was actually an illustration which was made for an infrastructure sector um, presentation originally. But the things that people like me are most likely to talk about are ecosystem based mitigation, the yellow bubble, which is what everybody's been talking about so far this evening. We've been talking about storage of carbon in ecosystems, the management of ecosystems to retain carbon or, or increase carbon. Um, but I also don't want you to go away without remembering that we are actually facing some climate change really happening, no matter how much mitigation goes on, and ecosystems can help us to adapt to that climate change. So we have the term ecosystem-based adaptation. All of these things are variations on the theme of nature-based solutions. Um, just to return to the theme of adaptation, I, I want to give you three examples. They're all things we've heard a little bit about today. So Tom talked about mangroves and mangrove restoration. So people might use mangroves, mangrove restoration instead of or in addition to, and you know, nature-based solutions aren't automatically substitutes. They can be complements to engineered approaches to improve sea defense. Uh, we could be restoring reefs also to increase sea defense and reduce the need for constructed breakwaters or we might be restoring forests to reduce siltation and dredging costs and prolong the life of for example hydroelectric dams in the face of increased erosion due to climate change 
all of these nature-based approaches have what are sometimes called co-benefits. So we may be aiming to help a particular community or indeed a company adapt to the impacts of climate change on people or assets. But if they're done properly, they have co-benefits for biodiversity conservation, for local livelihoods. We heard about that in the pest conversation. Um, for food security, for mental health, this is particularly true when we're talking about applying nature-based solutions in urban environments, and for carbon sequestration, which is what we've been talking about all along. But throughout all of this, the way we design and implement nature-based solutions depend, determines the level of trade-offs or the level of co-benefits and multiple benefits that we can achieve. We're making a great deal of progress now using linear optimization approaches and other very fancy modeling that I can't begin to explain in detail in ways, ways of essentially using multiple criteria to plan what we do and where we do it. And where we do it makes an enormous difference. Um, there's a recent study which looked at implementing, for example, a 5% ecosystem restoration target globally. And the biodiversity benefit that you get from that can vary by 11 fold, depending on where where that restoration takes place. But we can essentially co-prioritize and we can try to look for the parts of the world, if we're doing this globally, or the parts of a country or the parts of a jurisdiction that will help to deliver the most optimized solution of the benefits that we're looking for. Um, we see trade-offs as we start to do these optimizations. Um, if you're looking for biodiversity benefits, you might well be prioritizing wetlands or some of the more biodiverse shrublands. But if you're interested in carbon sequestration, obviously you're focusing particularly on forests. So those are some of the, the trade-offs we see. And I think I'll stop there in the interest of time and be happy to be involved in any discussion that follows on. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Val. That was really fascinating. Um, we are running a little bit behind schedule. We were hoping to have a, a sort of a nice question time now, then have a, a comfort break, and then return um, afterwards to to have a conversation about how computing uh, can help us. Uh, and I, I really don't want to eat too much into that uh, discussion. So I think that the, the the meeting after the break. So I think what we do is just ask one question for the moment, but but provide opportunities after the break to answer more questions if that's okay with everyone. And so the question I've got for you, Adam, if you're if you're online still, there we go, is about is about biochar and, and whether biochar is a useful way uh, to try and mitigate um, uh, to, to sequester carbon in soils. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think when it first was promoted, it was viewed almost as a silver bullet for helping improve agricultural productivity and storing carbon because it didn't break down. But then the more experiments that were done, people realized, well, actually, when it improves the productivity of plants, it also stimulates the decomposers, so the microbes. They're what's breaking down all that carbon in the dirt. So in many cases, biochar, when you are actually applying it into the soil, can result in losses. And then you also see losses if you apply biochar by mixing it in with the soil, because effectively you're tilling the soil. Now, in fires and natural fires, generally you do see an increase in the decomposition rates after charcoal is produced, but it's in relatively lower amounts and it goes down into the soil in a more natural process, like it's leached over years with water going into the soil. So th that is actually a very effective form of carbon sequestration in a natural ecosystem. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> No, it's very, very good. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. So I think I, I apologize. I see there's a nice pile of questions uh, mounting up for us, but I really don't think we can afford to talk through them now. But but we'll have a break. Um, three, four minutes. Please come back. Um, just uh, just a, a quick rest. And when we come back, we'll, it'll be me and uh, Professor Kejab talking about computers. Uh, but please do stay and ask some of your questions at the end of that second session. Thank you very much.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, so now we're going to be concentrating on computer and forest science for a better world. And, uh, and it's wonderful to have uh, Professor Kejab uh, joining us for this uh, second part of the session. Um, and it, we've produced a, a slideshow together. It's on his computer. And he's asked me in advance to, to, uh, to think through some of the ways that computer science could help um, us, us in what we're doing. And I've come up with a few ideas. Next slide, please, Kajab. So, sorry, there you go. So here are the issues um, uh, facing nature-based climate solutions that we think we can work on together. So what, one, one up, I think, please. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. I have, I have, my computer has decided to have its own mind over here. <laughs> uh, I thought I was in charge, okay. That what you guys mean by artificial intelligence? <laughs> uh, natural <laughs> incompetence. <laughs> here we go. So here we have uh, my first uh, thought, and that's tracking carbon. Uh, how do we actually measure carbon in vegetation and we really uh, and soils? And we really need to do this um, if we're going to have uh, carbon as a sort of se central mechanism for paying for these eco ecosystem services. So the idea, as, uh, as Michelle explained in her talk, is if we can monitor carbon, we can pay countries or organizations or, or, or whoever uh, locally to, to manage their forests and other ecosystems to protect that carbon, but we need to be able to measure it. And the traditional way is to go into, into, the, into, the, uh, um, into the forests or peatlands and actually measure carbon by hand. But all the tropical forest measurements uh, of trees would fit, uh, the whole area done would easily fit within the uh, perimeter of uh, the circumference of Cambridge, 30 kilometers squared at the very most. And there's hardly, there's, there's nowhere near enough plots in the tropics measuring carbon. So here's one bit of technology. This is JEDI, it's on the space station and it's firing laser beams uh, at Earth as we speak. It's a laser altimeter and it's, and it's bouncing off the surface of the Earth measuring heights of the forest canopy extremely accuracy and accurately and over the next two years trillions of, of data points will be uh, uh, billions at least many billions will be um, collected on forest height throughout the world and this is the sort of technology which we need to combine with field data in order to, to track carbon next please <clears throat> So a, a really complicated uh, thing which we, we definitely have to bear in mind is that we don't only want to use uh, the natural world uh, to sequester carbon. Uh, that would be a terrible waste if in the process of doing that, we actually destroyed biodiversity and damaged local livelihoods. There's a billion people um, who make their living um, on the edges of forests and in forests in various ways. And, and protecting their human rights is very important in this process. And secondly, um, a lot of these government commitments to, to plant trees to save, uh, to save the planet, um, the Trillion Trees campaign, a lot of those commitments from government are actually to put in plantations of fast growing things like eucalypt. And if they wipe out uh, biodiverse areas, then, um, then, we, then that's a, a tremendous loss. So we need systems for actually being more nuanced than just, uh, just looking at where forests are, but looking at where biodiversity are and understanding the incentives uh, for, for, uh, and, uh, for local, uh, local livelihoods to make sure people aren't disadvantaged in this, in this massive, uh, potentially massive campaign to, to change the way the world functions. Next, please. Another one we, which we need um, computers for is uh, to understand how climate change is going to uh, affect these carbon sinks in forests and peatlands. And this is a huge issue. The, the permafrost was on the BBC News last week. I don't know if you saw the poor BBC correspondent in Siberia getting uh, mosquitoed and, uh, <laughs> and really struggling as the permafrost melt and the fires uh, are sweeping through areas up there. Was, um, so, th so the world's changing and that's actually changing these carbon sinks. Another one of, of great concern is what's happening to the tropical forests as, as the climate gets hotter and the evaporative demand, the, uh, tra the transpiration of forests increases. And so there's already quite um, sophisticated simulation models looking at how, how this, this might be important. And here's just one example of a simulation model. Um, but they tend to be uh, put together by lots of different groups uh, working separately 
um, rather than um, than people um, on different modules rather than working together as, as a single team uh, and they're sort of coded in a very complicated way and there are opportunities I think to 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 have a sort of more unified uh, uh, data clean and, and code clean approach to to running these models and making them a, a lot faster so that we can we can run many many simulations to, to look at what's happening in the future and another one is keeping track of biodiversity. So um, you'll be familiar from, if you watch any David Attenborough program of the amazing technologies we have on the ground now to, to, to monitor biodiversity, the, the, the camera traps and various other sensors on the ground to look at what's happening. Um, we also got um, um, new technologies from space or from aircraft for monitoring biodiversity. And this, this map on the right here is from Peru and what we're seeing is a new type of sensor called a, a hyperspectral sensor and traditionally measurements from space are based uh, I've just taken a few measurements like red green blue and infrared uh, light reflectance off the surface of the earth and things come out sort of green or brown and that's what you can see for the most of the Amazon there but this hyperspectral sensor is measuring hundreds of wave bands uh, in the, in the visible, near infrared and shortwave infrared um, all at once. And that provides a huge amount more information uh, from which you can discern different forest types. So that's what this map is showing. I think it was 36 different forest types across Peru. So a much more nuanced view of biodiversity uh, using these hyperspectral sensors. They're, they're, they're not quite in space yet. They're, this is airborne remote sensing, but soon they will be. So colossal amounts of data uh, and opportunities to fuse data uh, ground-based, uh, airborne and from space to come up with a much better system for tracking biodiversity and seeing and checking that our nature-based solutions um, are solutions which help biodiversity as well as uh, carbon and other things. Thank you. And finally, um, sustainable supply chains. Uh, so this is not something I work on, I work on remote sensing, but this is actually, I'm just illustrating this with a bit of uh, work called TRACE. Uh, uh, led by Toby Gardner. Uh, now he was in Cambridge a few years ago, but now in, in Stockholm. And this appeared in uh, David Attenborough's uh, Extinction Programme a, a couple of weeks back, if some of you saw that. And so this, this is all about uh, how can we check when, we, uh, when a company says it's uh, um, uh, um, managing its plantation sustainably, not, not chopping down forests anymore, et cetera, that it's actually doing that. And how do we? How can we um, be completely have a completely transparent um, uh, supply chains? And this is an, an incredibly important thing in our in our uh, efforts to conserve what's left of biodiversity around the world. Uh, and so this is just one um, program trying to do that, and looking at the, sh the detailed shipping records, vast numbers of those, and 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 using those to track uh, the source of. of uh, food products. Um, but the WCMC, UNEP WCMC, where Val works, has also got another big program uh, um, working on this at the moment. So that, that's another thing where there's lots of data coming in, uh, using them in important, uh, in important ways uh, to, to, to help uh, inform, uh, inform decision makers. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so I got to Cambridge just about a year ago and my background is in computer science and the background is computer networking. And what I realized in talking to David and others is that there's a lot of data out there and there's a lot of capabilities that computer science has built, has built over the last several decades that can be used to solve or help solve some of these challenges. We've all heard of the Amazon, but we've also heard of Amazon the company. And if you think about it, why is Amazon the company so successful? It's because they have the ability to manage lots of data and to use the power of AI and to sense the systems out there and to control them. So these systems, which are called cyber physical systems, are systems which have sensors, communication and control. And then we bring them to data centers where you can use AI and then something called blockchain we'll talk about in just a moment. But the big picture is computer science has developed a number of very sophisticated techniques that are mostly used for corporate gain, but these can be retargeted for doing all sorts of solutions. And I'll give one example. So the one sense, one thing that we had developed in the last 50 years or so is the ability to serve, sense things both from the space using satellites 
And also using these really small sensors, the sensor shown on the right-hand side is a few millimeters across and it senses temperature. You can literally embed millions of these in forests or homes or buildings, but you can actually uh, do things that are impossible to dream of even a few years ago. Likewise, with communication networks, especially using uh, the soon to come 5G networks, as well as uh, low earth satellite uh, communication networks, we can gather data from the sens sensors and ship them around the world, and in particular, ship them to data centers, which are then able to aggregate lots and lots of data, and where we can process them using computing. We can compute these data centers typically have between 100,000 and a million servers. And so it's possible to do a large amount of analysis on them. Some kinds of analysis that people can do on them is, for example, using artificial intelligence, which is essentially one way of saying how to forecast the future based on past patterns. So as you have more and more data, you're able to understand patterns better and better. And these patterns could be, for example, if you see this spectral image, this means it's a forest of type one. If you see a different image, it's a forest of type two. Let's extract those patterns. Now when we see those images again, we therefore think it's this kind of forest. And the better we are at collecting data using sensors and streaming them to data centers, the better we are at, at analyzing them and using artificial intelligence. And finally, uh, we can control what things are going to happen, how things are done on the ground at a very fine scale. For example, we talked about uh, fertilizer use for natural for conservation of soil. Imagine that the fertilizers are being controlled uh, as they're being uh, from, from farm by a, by a small controller, like the one shown on the bottom left, which only costs a few dollars. And we are linking this to earth observation and we're linking it to soil conditions so that the precise amount of fertilizer needed for that piece of land is released and no more. This means there would not be excess fertilizer use and there wouldn't be fertilizer lost to the ocean causing algal blooms. And then if you want to have trust in systems, we can use something called blockchains. And the easiest way to think about it is as a bulletin board in the sky that everybody can read. So if you write something on this bulletin board, Everybody knows what's there and you can't change it ever again. So now we can see how to combine all these things. Let me give one example of a system and that combines these things. So here, here I'm showing an example of a system that we built over the summer. And what you're seeing on the top left, which was the Hansen data set and the other table, the carbon map, are essentially data sets collected by satellites from the sky, which tell us where in the world there is a forest. Now, what we are showing over here is that a landowner who owns a forest wants sponsorship, payment for environmental services, and they go to a management agent. You know, we put in WCMC, but let's say any management agent, and they say, I want somebody to sponsor my forest. Can you please certify that I own this forest and this forest exists? And then we can put that certificate in the blockchain. Now we come to the website where somebody wants to fund it, and the funder says, do I know the forest is actually there? Yes you can see the certificate because we've seen it from the sky. And if the landowner cuts down the forest, the next year they won't get paid. So we have proof that the forest exists. What about selling the same forest over and over again to multiple funders? Again, the blockchain, because it's globally visible and immutable, makes it possible for us to ensure that a funder is not gonna be asked to fund something that somebody else has been funding. So I'm just giving a glimpse of the kinds of things that one could do using uh, cutting edge computer science techniques to solve very practical problems that lead to uh, lack of trust when we make payments for environmental services. But of course, computer science can be used for a number of other things, including logistics for tree planting, uh, analysis of images from camera traps, the ability to op use very large scale optimization when talking about trade-offs between biodiversity and, uh, uh, and carbon sequestration. You can also do uh, better modeling and better simulation of uh, forests. So the, in summary, these set of challenges that have been posed uh, to us because of climate change are very large indeed. But luckily we also have in front of us a very large number of very sophisticated tools from computer science. And the good news is that it is now becoming increasingly possible for us to tackle these problems at scale using the tools of sensing, communication, control, optimization, 
uh, data centers, AI, and blockchain, all of which weren't really available 10 years ago. So with that, I'll stop, and I hope we can answer some questions from the audience. Thank you. David? Thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking through the questions uh, as you were uh, as, 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 as you were speaking. And there's, there's one actually about, um, could you perhaps talk, talk a little bit more about how you see artificial intelligence being used in some of these applications uh, in, uh, in, in HK solutions? So let me talk about a project that uh, actually is near to David's heart because it's done by one of his students. And it's predicting where deforestation is going to happen in the forest. So if you had satellite images going back, let's say the last 10 years, and you have image maps of showing this, what you could do is to say, if the images have this progression in this forest, then we can predict, we can forecast that next year, this is where we have, we, we, we're likely to see degradation. Intuitively, you see forests being cut down next to roads, for example, or next to farms, which are the edges of the forest. But those are human-based rules. With AI, what you can do is to say, here I'm going to show you 10,000 different images of forest degradation and then based on this we can train an AI so that it can across the world classify which forests are likely to be degraded and this I think is a beautiful and brilliant use of AI to, to, to tell us where should we put our resources uh, to use to prevent degradation. This would be for those areas which are most likely to be degraded. Thank you very much. There's one for me, I guess. Uh, importing wood into the UK was mentioned earlier on. Isn't that quite a selfish way to solve the deforestation issue? Why should we consider ourselves separate from the rest of the world? I think that's a, re a really good question. So we've, because actually, uh, much of the, many of the problems we face as humanity are driven by uh, an increase in, our, in the human population and also our consumption of resources. And we only have to think uh, about how much cardboard we're using uh, these days uh, with everything being delivered uh, through Amazon and other companies to our home. A lot of that's recycled but even so this vast increase in, in cardboard would be an example of, of uh, some, something which is causing uh, us to, to need to, to uh, chop down even more for us and, and, and the supply of, of food to us um, is definitely causing uh, deforestation. So, that, so that's, that's the huge dilemma. How can we minimize our impact on uh, on uh, forests overseas while still delivering um, on increasing forest cover in the UK and if, if we if we don't change our diets I think it's inevitable uh, if we plant on grasslands then we're, we're actually going to affect um, deforestation elsewhere in the world uh, if we plant on agricultural and arable lands uh, growing crops uh, again we're, ha we're having a knock-on uh, uh, consequence for for food, for getting our food elsewhere in the world. So we, we do need to, to constantly remind ourselves of that constraint in what we're doing. So thank you for that one. Are there any more questions uh, about the computing, uh, the link between computing and... Uh, in this one at the end, which talks, how can we ensure AI serves our objectives? Uh, I have been doing warnings. Um, I mean, in the end, AI serves uh, the objectives of the people who are running it. I mean, and so when you say our objectives, presumably what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, people as opposed to corporations. And it is indeed true that today uh, much of the AI is controlled by corporations, but there are a number of initiatives to take control away from corporations and towards uh, the, the people. So Open AI Initiative, for example, which is uh, run out of the United States, uh, it certainly has the goal of opening up these kinds of initiatives and some of the most cutting edge developments in AI are coming from open AI. So um, I think, you know, just speaking from a, from a general perspective, uh, any new technology obviously is going to be exploited first by the people who have the capital to exploit it. But once it becomes more available, I think it's possible to democratize access to it. And that's certainly an intent for many of us. I've got a question. I think it's for Adam, or maybe for me. Uh, is there any scope to plant more trees in cold climates when the per permafrost is melting in Siberia to counter the major release of carbon that will result? Do you want to have a go at answering that one, Adam? Otherwise yeah, I'll sure. <clears throat> so that's also that's a really interesting question. So uh, 
A big issue with the loss of carbon from melting of permafrost is that essentially you're heating the soil that then the microbes are able to decompose the carbon that was frozen in that soil. And when you plant trees on that landscape, you accelerate that decomposition. So when David was discussing planting trees on peaty soils in the UK, that's exactly what they observed. And then there's also fire to think about. Uh, when you plant trees in the boreal zone, they're usually very flammable trees. And when there's a drought year, which there definitely will be, it'll catch fire. And in fact, because you have these more flammable trees, it'll probably also burn through the organic permafrost. So you have to deal with these uh, downstream consequences that may take decades to occur, but they incur a very large penalty. Thank you. Uh, we've got one about blockchain at the bottom there, one for you. Okay, let me see. Uh, uh, this, is, this is by Caroline Toberg. Uh, yes, so blockchain, as I said, the easiest way to understand it is this bulletin board in the sky where you, once you write something, it can't be erased. So, uh, and it's also very scalable. You can have millions and billions of entries if you wish. And so uh, hy hypothetically, it is certainly possible to have blockchains that help provide consumers with information about the carbon emissions and products they buy. Um, one of the best known blockchains is this one for diamonds, where you can uh, look at a diamond and see where it's been produced so you can track the supply chain. And that's because a diamond is a high value product. Um, if you have something that is a lower value product, then the uh, existing blockchain technology is uh, at the moment, it's still too expensive for you to do it for lower value products. So if you want to buy, you know, a box of a tissue paper or, you know, a notebook, which is you're going to write in, which is made from paper, and you would like to know the carbon emissions embedded in this particular product, um, it, it, it would be, you, you couldn't do it with the blockchain technology today. But again, this is something that a lot of scientists are working on to try to reduce the cost of blockchain down to the point where we can envision doing this. And I believe that such kind of traceability, even for lo low value products, should be possible in the next two to three years. Thank you. There's one which one for me. I think we're going to have uh, we're going to just run over a few minutes later over, over eight if you don't mind. But we'll I think we'll finish at five past eight. Um, but we're, we're running a little bit late on the other thing. So so one for me is uh, what sort of resolution can you currently identify forest types with from multispectral hyperspectral imagery? Uh, how many different forest types? And there was another one about whether it's actually damaging the planet and us firing these lasers at at the planet. So I'll answer, answer those two together. So firstly, no, it doesn't do any damage to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the planet or us um, at all, the, the lasers. It's actually this, the, the same sort of technology that you have in um, driverless cars to, to create the, the three-dimensional uh, image of what's, what's surrounding the car, but it's, it's launched a much more powerful laser from space. Uh, but no, it doesn't do any damage to us. Uh, and the resolution actually on the air on if you fly them uh, you you've got about two or three meter resolution each little pixel and it's quite easy to identify in um, temperate woodlands uh, different species from that technique uh, so you're down to that sort of um, uh, level of resolution in the tropical forests which are amazingly diverse it's much harder to to spot more than um, sort of a handful of species in those systems but nevertheless you can differentiate forest types. Uh, that example I gave in Peru, I think was 36 different forest types uh, uh, identified. So it is, a, it is a bit of a game changer, particularly if you fuse it with other data sets like the laser, laser scanning, or indeed high resolution photos. And bring all those data together and using AI techniques, you've got a really powerful set of data to, to, to resolve these issues. And I, just, just to, to answer the AI question below it in the, in the list, um, yes, actually sort of fusing lots of different types of imagery uh, and using AI is, is a really powerful technique which people are just starting to use. And what we're often lacking actually is the label data set. So uh, there's the famous sort of, uh, cat example where there's millions and millions of pictures of cats which are AI as uh, um, algorithms have worked to identify 
to, to come up with a way of identifying cats. We actually don't really have that for forests as yet or vegetation types uh, and having much more data on, from the ground to train the algorithms is going to be important. Maybe I can take the two questions on uh, uh, initiatives for AI for forestry management. So, and is there a company that's doing it? Uh, there's a company called uh, Sylvia Terra uh, that is uh, actually uh, using AI for creating cloud-free uh, data sets because clouds are obviously a problem when you do earth observation. And so if you look at Sylvia Terra, uh, they've been doing this. There's a few other companies uh, that uh, Mantle Labs is another one which is also has a product for removing clouds using AI and they're using it for crop management, not for forestry, but it's similar. Uh, Nick Menzies has a very interesting question of how can you use AI to make predictions of things that like forest fires uh, where, you know, where this, well, it started in, a, in an unexpected way. Uh, I think the way to think about this is, uh, if I can go a little bit into uh, mathematics here, I'll just say that uh, while we can't predict exact futures, we can predict that certain probabilities of events are going to be higher or lower. And it's very simple to understand this. If I can tell you tomorrow, with 40% chance it's going to be rain, there is a future tomorrow with rain, and there's a future tomorrow with no rain, right? And these are both possible futures. We don't know which one is actually going to be instantiated. Now, with the computer, what I can do is I can try both futures out. I can say, I'm going to do the future with rain, I'm going to do the future with no rain, and I'm going to simulate or forecast what's going to happen. So imagine now that I say, because of climate change, forests in California are going to be drier. So the probability there's going to be a fire somewhere in California goes up from 0.5% to, I don't know, 20%. I'm just making up these numbers. So what I can now do is to simulate that if a fire started and it comes to the end of six months of drought, how will it spread? And that tells me, I don't know where it came from. I don't know what the cause was. Is it a gender reveal party or some you know, fireworks or some arsonist? It doesn't really matter, but I can still figure out that consequence of an unexpected event somewhere in Southern California due to climate change. And so that's the kind of analysis we do. We are looking at a trajectory or a simulation of possible futures, but you can analyze very many different futures and that's how we can look at, look at a portman to a, a, a collection, an ensemble of possible futures and understand how they possibly work out. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we know what could possibly happen. I think David. Thank you very much. Um, there's one, one more perhaps um, j j from Anna Sylvia, and she's asking a question in relation to Chile about whether you can pick up monocultures from, from native vegetation and track the changes. Actually, one of my first PhD students did exactly that in Chile in 2006, he published his work. Uh, that was using fairly basic uh, multispectral sensors from space. And it's, it's, it's actually fairly straightforward to do. His uh, work was um, amazingly picked up, let's say, by uh, the Chilean press and was, uh, was, was a, a really controversial paper at the time, uh, uh, highlighting the vast changes which had happened over a short time frame. Uh, I think this is a question of how can different research groups collaborate in analyzing the data produced from satellite images of forests? Let me kind of be the spokesperson for computer science again and say, have you heard of a thing called Wikipedia? I mean, could you imagine 20 years ago that Encyclopedia Britannica and all these big encyclopedias could be beaten by just this, you know, bunch of ragtag, bunch of people sitting in their homes writing up encyclopedia entries? The reason is because in the back end, there's databases and there's validation, there's trust relationships, there's upvoting, there's all the mechanisms to create a virtual community of trust between people. And then you get very high quality results. Imagine not taking Wikipedia and using it for sharing data from satellite images where people say, here's my data, this is the way I did it, and other people can use it. And technologies such as Wikipedia, GitHub, and uh, other such community-driven, uh, participatory, uh, computer-based systems make it possible to do sharing on a scale and at a level of detail that is not possible before. And that gives me a lot of hope. On that note, I think um, we, we've, we've gone over our allotted time and, I, don't, uh, and I, I, I thank you ever so much for everybody who's come. It's been a real, really a great pleasure to to be uh, talking with you tonight and thanks for all the questions. So we're gonna let you go. So thank you very much again.
Bye-bye.